West Coast College Prep Academy presents a critical reading of Henry David Thoreau's On the Duty of Civil Disobedience, Part 1, featuring Dr. Brett Parker. For our first digital lecture, we are going to conduct a critical reading of Henry David Thoreau's 1849 essay, Resistance to Civil Government. Since today the essay is more commonly known by its 1849 publication title, On the Duty of Civil Disobedience, that is the title we will use in our reading, and thus the essay will from this point forward be referred to as Civil Disobedience. Through our critical reading of Civil Disobedience, I hope to improve your capacity to read historical documents so that you are better prepared for the SAT and the AP English Language exam, strengthen your reading comprehension skills, develop your capacity to rhetorically analyze texts, advance your understanding of arguments, and augment your vocabulary. Thoreau's Civil Disobedience is an exceptionally important and influential essay. As Cynthia Whelan Lawton writes in her 1968 essay, Thoreau and the Rhetoric of Dissent, over a century has passed since Thoreau first voiced his ideas on civil disobedience, yet his ideas inspire citizens today to take up his cause and fight for the right of individual conscience. She points out that the essay is Thoreau's first expression of his abolitionism, his commitment to advocate for the end of slavery, and that in this essay, he argues that it is the citizen's duty to obey his or her inner voice or conscience. And if that voice runs contrary to the political machinations of society, citizens should shun society. Thus, for Thoreau, Given the facts of slavery and the American government's support for it, a man of conscience must dissociate himself from the American government because it was the government of the slave. Lawton goes on to argue that Thoreau's essay, Civil Disobedience, is a model of the rhetoric of dissent. The opening statement, which affirms his belief that the best government is that which governs least, followed by a call to action in which he urges that every man make it known what he considers an ideal government, immediately and effectively establishes his position. This is followed by a series of rhetorical questions urging the supremacy of individual conscience. Throughout the essay, Thoreau uses imagery such as the picture of man going to war against their wills, and the similes of man serving as machines with their bodies and change likened to birth and death, which convulse the body. If, as Lawton maintains, Thoreau's essay, Civil Disobedience, is a model of the rhetoric of dissent, then the question becomes, what can civil disobedience teach us about the rhetorical modes and techniques of protest writing. Let's start by identifying the soaps, speaker, occasion, audience, purpose, subject. Speaker, Henry David Thoreau, an American writer and philosopher who was born in 1817 and died in 1862. Thoreau is a transcendentalist, someone who believes that while both human beings and nature are inherently good, civilization, society, industry, and government are corrupting forces. And therefore, individuals must maintain their independence to resist these corrupting influences. Occasion. The specific motivating occasion that led Thoreau to write Civil Disobedience was the Mexican-American War of 1846 to 1848. The fact that the essay was published after the culmination of the war in 1849 
suggests that the motivating occasion was not simply the war in itself, but instead its relationship to the American practice and institution of slavery. As Lawton points out, Thoreau believed that the United States war with Mexico was promoted by slaveholders who were using the government to extend slavery into new territories. Audience. As we read the essay, you will notice that the audience is not, as you may expect, the American government or even slaveholders, but instead, everyday people. As Joan Cooney asserts in her 1995 essay, Neither Non-Resistance Nor Violence, Thoreau's Consistent Response to Social Evils, Thoreau directed his anti-slavery essays and lectures not at the slaveholders far away who were confirmed in their evil, but at people whom he believed he could convert, the citizens of the Commonwealth of Massachusetts, whose support for the status quo propped up slavery. Purpose. Presumably, the purpose of the essay is, as the quotation from Cooney's essay suggests, to persuade citizens to oppose slavery and adopt measures to resist it. We can return to the question of purpose after we have read the essay to evaluate the accuracy of this assumption. Subject. On this question, we can gain some initial insight from the title of the essay, On the Duty of Civil Disobedience. The title suggests that the primary argument of the essay concerns our ethical obligation to use civil disobedience to resist injustice. Again, we can reevaluate this statement of the argument once we have read the essay. As we read the essay, we are going to pay close attention to the rhetorical techniques that Thoreau employs. However, to get us started, in her essay, Cooney identifies the primary rhetorical techniques that Thoreau uses as follows. Appeals to the reason and consciences of his fellow citizens. A critique of the relationship between the individual and the state. Advocacy of nonviolent but effective means of dealing with unjust laws, and the use of personal anecdotes, his own experiences and actions, to inspire others to take up similar forms of resistance. Let's take a look at civil disobedience. We will move through the essay paragraph by paragraph. As we do so, we will identify and define challenging vocabulary, break down complicated sentences, write sentences that summarize the content and identify the function of each paragraph, analyze the rhetorical techniques that Thoreau employs. Here is the first paragraph. I heartily accept the motto, that government is best which governs least, and I should like to see it acted up to more rapidly and systematically. Carried out, it finally amounts to this, which also I believe, that government is best which governs not at all. And when men are prepared for it, that will be the kind of government which they will have. Government is at best but an expedient, but most governments are usually, and all governments are sometimes, inexpedient. The objections which have been brought against a standing army, and they are many and weighty and deserve to prevail, may also at last be brought against a standing government. The standing army is only an arm of the standing government. The government itself 
which is only the mode which the people have chosen to execute their will, is equally liable to be abused and perverted before the people can act through it. Witness the present Mexican war. The work of comparatively a few individuals using the standing government as their tool. For, in the outset, the people would not have consented to this measure. Let's begin by tackling some of the more challenging vocabulary and terms. Expedient. Convenient and practical, although possibly improper or immoral. Inexpedient. Not practical, suitable, or advisable. Accordingly, when Thoreau writes, government is at best but an expedient, but most governments are usually, and all governments are sometimes, inexpedient. We can interpret the sentence as saying, first, that government, though immoral, is often practical and convenient, and second, that all governments are occasionally not even practical, suitable, or advisable. That is, for Thoreau, government, despite being immoral, can be a convenient means of accomplishing collective ends, but is often not an immoral necessity, but an impractical encumbrance. Now, what you should rhetorically recognize about this sentence is that Thoreau is using antithesis, a juxtaposition of opposing terms, often in parallel structure, that tends to place emphasis on the second idea. Here, the terms are expedient and inexpedient. With inexpedient coming second, the emphasis ends up on inexpedient. Here, the idea that benefits from the antithetical construction is that most governments are not only immoral, but also impractical. That is, most governments, for Thoreau, are useless. Thoreau also uses the terms standing army and standing government. The objections which have been brought against a standing army, and they are many and weighty and deserve to prevail, may also at last be brought against a standing government. While standing army is a familiar phrase meaning a permanent professional army, one that continues to exist whether or not a war is taking place, standing government is coined by Thoreau and presumably means a government that exists permanently, even when we have no use for it. Accordingly, in this sentence, Thoreau is furthering the anarchist sentiment that is introduced in the first two sentences of the essay, in which he writes, I heartily accept the motto, that government is best which governs least, and I should like to see it acted up to more rapidly and systematically. Carried out, it finally amounts to this, which also I believe. That government is best which governs not at all. And when men are prepared for it, that will be the kind of government which they will have. In fact, it is this sentiment that government is best when it does as little as possible and that one day people will no longer need government that opens the essay and grabs the reader's attention. Hence, if Thoreau is using a hook or attention getter, then the strategy would perhaps be one of provocation, of rattling us to attention by going against the common grain. Now, I say perhaps, 
because I'm not entirely sure that hooking us through provocation is what Thoreau is doing. There are a few other options here. Perhaps, instead, Thoreau is simply grabbing our attention by launching directly into his argument. If we think of the opening in this way, then Thoreau is being candid, establishing his credibility or ethos by not wasting our time, by its demonstrating that he is direct and honest, and that what he has to say is of such importance that he will not delay in getting to the point. If, in the opening, he is simply launching directly into his argument, then it does not, however, follow that he is not using any type of opening gambit to grab our attention. Instead, the parallel constructions of that government is best which governs least and that government is best which governs not at all demonstrate a stylistic acumen that would suggest that Thoreau is hooking his readers by giving his writing an appealing structure. There is yet another potential explanation for Thoreau's opening gambit. Perhaps, in Thoreau's time, it was a common motto to hold that that government is best which governs least. In this case, the rhetorical strategy behind his opening move would be the one that teachers so often advocate, using a common quotation to draw the reader in. However, as I have argued in the past, using a common quotation to grab the attention of the reader is a rather weak technique. After all, what is common is familiar, and what is familiar is by its very nature uninteresting. Yet, even if that government is best which governs least, was a common motto at the time, it is, for some, a common sentiment today. It does not necessarily follow that the strategy that Thoreau is using to draw his readers in is simply using a common quotation. In fact, were I reading a student's rhetorical analysis of this opening gambit, in which the student had stated that Thoreau draws his readers in by using a common quotation, I would write in the margin of the essay that that analysis is half right half wrong, that that analysis fails to take into consideration what Thoreau does in the second sentence. For, if the motto here, as Thoreau suggests, is common, then it is not simply the use of this motto that draws the reader in, but the logical extension of it in the second sentence. If the best government is the one that governs the least, then it follows that the best government governs not at all. Accordingly, the opening strategy is, perhaps, making the familiar unfamiliar. That is, making the familiar interesting. I would posit that, in his opening rhetorical move, Thoreau is doing the four things that we have identified. First, he is launching directly into his argument. Second, he is employing parallel construction. Third, he's making the familiar unfamiliar. And fourth, by extending the logic of the familiar into unfamiliar territory, he is provoking his readers. Let's consider the structure of the paragraph. Thoreau asserts that he would like to see a government that governs least. He goes on to suggest that the ideal government is one that governs not at all. To support this point, he reasons that government, despite being immoral, is often a convenient means of accomplishing collective ends, but is, sometimes, 
not just an immoral necessity, but an impractical burden. He then further develops this argument through analogy. He uses the familiar concept of a standing army, as well as the familiar arguments against it, to suggest that a government is a standing government, and encourages his readers to apply the common arguments against a standing army to the standing government. The fact that Thoreau does not remind us of the arguments against a standing army confirms for us that we are not his original audience. If we were, he would recognize our ignorance of these arguments and suggest that these arguments would be familiar to his audience. We can, nevertheless, imagine what one argument against a standing army may have been. That a government that maintains a standing army will enter unnecessary military conflicts so as to justify the existence of the standing army. Students of American history would remind us of another argument against a standing army. The one that was raised by James Madison at the Constitutional Convention in 1787. A standing military force with an overgrown executive will not long be safe companions to liberty. The means of defense against foreign danger have been always the instruments of tyranny at home. Thus, in pointing to the common arguments against a standing army and asking his readers to apply them to a standing government, Thoreau is suggesting that it is dangerous to have a government, for governments will do more than they need to so as to justify their continued existence, and that governments, as long as they continue to exist, threaten to devolve into tyranny. In the next sentence, Thoreau continues this argument by reminding us that government is nothing more than a means for carrying out our collective will, the mode which the people have chosen to execute their will, and by warning that the government is just as likely to corrupt our will as it is to implement it, equally liable to be abused and perverted. To provide evidence for this claim, he then introduces the example of the Mexican War, a war that he posits would not have had popular consent, as, and is, instead, the result of the manipulation of the government by a select few. Now that we have clarified what is being said and what is taking place in the opening paragraph, we will reread it together so that you can, hopefully, recognize what I have been saying about it. I heartily accept the motto, that government is best which governs least, and I should like to see it acted up to more rapidly and systematically. Carried out, it finally amounts to this, which also I believe, that government is best which governs not at all. And when men are prepared for it, that will be the kind of government which they will have. Government is, at best, but an expedient, but most governments are usually, and all governments are sometimes, inexpedient. The objections which have been brought against the standing army, and they are many and weighty and deserve to prevail, may also at last be brought against the standing government. The standing army is only an arm of the standing government. The government itself, which is only the mode which the people have chosen to execute their will, is equally liable to be abused and perverted before the people can act through it. Witness 
the present Mexican war, the work of a comparatively few individuals using the standing government as their tool. For in the outset, the people would not have consented to this measure. Finally, before moving on to the next paragraph, we should write a sentence that summarizes what the paragraph is doing, its function, and what the paragraph is saying, its content. The first paragraph advances the argument that, since government is an immoral institution that, at best, is a convenient means to carry out our collective will, but at worst, threatens our liberty and betrays our interests, it should do as little as possible. For tomorrow's lecture, we will continue our reading of Thoreau's On the Duty of Civil Disobedience. If you have the time, I would suggest that you preview the essay by trying to read it yourself. You could even practice writing statements that summarize the function and content of each paragraph. You will find a copy of the essay here. For more information on our online education, please visit westcoastcollegeprep.com.